Welcome to the Pomerantz Mentor Vignettes, sponsored by ProScan MRI Education Foundation. Today we focus on the hip with a primer of labral pathology, part six of our vignette series. Let's start out with a magnified view of the hip labrum, showing a small curvilinear area of hyperintensity that extends into the suprolateral labrum of the left hip. This normal variant presents tremendous challenges and difficulties to those trying to interpret a labral tear. How can we differentiate this common variation from a true tear? Well, here are a couple of tip-offs. First, the sulcus is shallow. If it's a developmental fissure, it will also be very shallow. The sulcus has a rounded top to it or configuration. And one often sees a thin rim of fibrocartilaginous hypointensity around it. Not so in cases of traumatic labral tear. The traumatic labral tear is often more knife blade, is associated with swelling. It's often anterior. It's more than a third to a fourth of the depth of the labrum. It's often a half to three quarters the depth. While the sulcus never exits the top, a true tear exits the top commonly. Cysts are never present with a normal sulcus, but paralabral cysts or truly pseudocysts are common, even with small labral tears. The normal sulcus is slightly off the vertical axis or plane. It is not parallel ever to the long axis of the labrum. And occasionally, there will be little slits of hypointensity, synechii, or paralabral plica that may sometimes simulate a little sliver of labrum that has been detached or come off. Let's look at our labral anatomy for a moment. We have the bony acetabulum, the so-called medullary bone, an osteal bone, or cancellous bone and then the surrounding cortical bone. Around it, peripherally, the, fibrocartila the fibrocartilaginous like labrum with a smooth transition to the hyaline articular cartilage where marginal erosions may be seen with shearing phenomena. Suprolaterally, the iliofemoral ligament and capsule which is tightly attached to the acetabulum no more than three to four millimeters above the reflection of the labrum, where the labrum meets the top of the acetabulum. There are some normal depressions and irregularities that we'll talk about a little later. You will be able to see the transition zone between fibrocartilage and hyaline cartilage. It's incumbent upon you to distinguish injuries between the two. A small recess exists between the labrum and the capsule. It may fill with a small amount of tissue and even a small amount of fluid, but it should not dissect up a substantial way along the acetabulum, a subject to be refined and discussed later on. The blood supply to the labrum is rather scant. This is a problem. The hip bears tremendous amounts of force, sometimes 12 times the body weight when you perform the act of jumping. Yet the blood supply is via peripheral capsular blood vessels that perforate the outer portion of the labrum. So once it's torn, its ability, especially along this hypovascular undersurface, to repair itself is very limited. Here is an example of a small physiologic cleft. The difference between a cleft and a sulcus is really all about the shape of the apex. A cleft has a more tapered tip, whereas a sulcus has a more rounded tip. So what's the difference between a physiologic cleft and a true tear? A true tear is usually more knife blade it's not so wide at the base, whereas a physiologic cleft is wide at the base 
and narrow at the apex. As stated, the sulcus is curvilinear at the apex. Here's an example of a sublabral sulcus. Shallow, without depth, without cysts, without inflammation. These sulci can extend all the way antero-inferiorly, and they often, deep, they often deepen in the antero-inferior quadrant of the hip. Fraying and injury of the hip commonly occurs with a combination of compressive forces, shear forces, and together they, together they may produce fibrillation, thinning, slight irregularity that is prominent on both the hyaline side but a little harder to recognize on the labral side unless a substantive effusion is present. Here's an example of a simple vertical tear. They can be partial thickness or full thickness. An example of multiple vertical tears. Now imagine if tears that are vertically oriented are then imaged with a paraaxial. They will have a much different configuration. Imagine if they're imaged sagittally. If the sagittal slice doesn't go exactly through the tear, you won't see it. And when it goes exactly through the tear, you'll see a defect. The appearance of these tears is dramatically different in each plane, with the coronal plane being the most favored nation plane for labral evaluation of the hip. The radial tear is a truncation or complete truncation of the outer, middle, and sometimes even portions of the inner third of the meniscus, leaving either nothing or only a thin sliver of meniscus. An axial projection will show a meniscus that comes to a sudden stop, whereas a sagittal slice will show a chunky meniscus and then nothing but synovium, inflammation, and blood. Then the complex tear is self-explanatory, directions of tear that defy description and are not just vertical and not just horizontal. Then there is the meniscocapsular separation, rather self-explanatory, with the capsule displaced away from the acetabulum and the labrum for a distance that is more than three or four millimeters and is often associated with extensive soft tissue swelling around it. Concomitant labral tears are often present with this type of capsular separation. Here's an example of a labroacetabular separation. Some folks refer to this as a chondroosseous separation. The separation may include the fibrocartilage from the bone, the fibrocartilage from the hyaline cartilage, or the fibrocartilage from both. Occasionally, you will even see these two separated, bone and fibrocartilage, these two, hyaline cartilage and fibrocartilage, and not displayed here. The capsule can even come off, a so-called triple separation. And then we have complex forces that work together that may produce irregular tears that may involve the margin of the hyaline cartilage or complexly the margin of the hyaline cartilage resulting in a separation of both the fibrocartilage from the hyaline cartilage and the fibrocartilage from the bone with a tear in the hyaline cartilage and with the previously described capsular separation lobbed on board. Sometimes the tears, just like their colleagues, their friends in the shoulder and in other parts of the body, may make paramenisical pseudocysts. What's a pseudocyst? It's a proteinaceous fluid collection without an epithelial lining. Sometimes those pseudocysts sit within the capsule, and we call them intraarticular pseudocysts. These little globular lesions are always a sign of a meniscal tear. And then sometimes they break through the capsule, in which case we refer to them simply as extracapsular cysts or, strictly speaking, pseudocysts, as they're not epithelial lined. So this concludes our primer on labral injuries. You've seen diagrammatically the components that can be injured. The labrum, the hyaline cartilage, the acetabulum, the capsule, they can be injured individually or together. 
The injuries can be simple. They can be complex. Their shape depends heavily on the projection you're going to image them in, with the most favored nation projection being the coronal projection. Thanks a lot. Look forward to seeing you on our next vignette.